that combines geo stories with long form articles. So here's a and and maps. So here's a, a sort of a way to browse all these articles in this section of the site about nature's bounty. And the purpose of this site, I should say, is to inspire and inform a collective conservation vision for the James River watershed in Virginia. And um, so here you can browse the articles on the map and open just a traditional long form article about American eel. And uh, you can get a map and actually expand the map showing its incredible migration from the Sargasso Sea up to the headwaters of the James. Um, you can perhaps open up geo stories as well. So here's a geo story about student expedition. And then you can toggle between articles and geo stories and a whole gallery of interactive maps. So something we're doing here is using, creating multiple simple maps instead of one Uber map viewer that has lots of layers and buttons and menus that to turn on and off. We're doing lots of simple maps. So here you can cruise through this carousel or this gallery of those maps. Here's another example of a site that we did with, uh, for, sponsored by Statoil with The Economist, a new scientist with charts and graphs and geo stories as well as long form articles by those partners. And then um, we're also now beginning to experiment with the Google plugin and trying to integrate that other type of content in smoothly into an experience that has a 3D globe map. Um, finally, this is my last slide. Um, some of the lessons that we're, we're starting to gain here is, first I want to say, do add maps to your multimedia products. Um, provide that environmental context and data. And you can spoon feed these maps on the back of the picture presented story. So the map becomes kind of secondary, but you sort of bring it along with the stuff people really love, the eye candy, the pictures, and the story, and then use multiple simple maps rather than a single complex map. That's it. Great, thanks. Thanks, uh, Frank. And I'm sure if you want to see his other PowerPoint, which he started out with, we can show you it up. Um, next, we get uh, to listen to um, Richard Edwards, um, Chief Executive of WildScreen. He's going to talk about the power of wildlife imagery as a commun uh, conservation communications tool. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of it, um, for those of you who don't know WildScreen, um, WildScreen is a education, conservation communications charity based in Bristol in the UK. Our mission is to use the power of wildlife imagery to inspire people around the world to discover, to value and protect our natural world. As we believe films and photographs are one of the most powerful, one of the most emotive, one of the most efficient ways of raising environmental awareness. To this end, we run um, the Wildscreen Film Festival, the world's largest and most influential um, wildlife and environmental film festival. Wild Photos, one of the UK's leading uh, nature photography centers, <coughs> and a project called Archive, which is an online centralized collection of the very best films and photographs of the world's threatened species. And the, the project I'd like to talk to you uh, a little bit about um, this afternoon. I don't know why it's a right, a right hand click. click. Oh, right, brilliant. Otherwise. Otherwise. Um, from the BBC's Frozen Planet, the, uh, the latest mega-series, mega which was recently aired in the UK to record audiences, to the Wildlife Photography of the Year competition, which is seen by millions of people around the world, to National Geographic magazine, which has a, a readership of some 32 million in the US alone. There are many examples of the audience, the appetite, for powerful wildlife imagery and a good natural history story, bringing the wonders of the natural world into the homes, into the hearts, into the minds of the public around the world. There are also some direct conservation wins to have with this, uh, this media too. Um, Xi Jinong made a film about the young and snub-nosed macaque, and that catalyzed a student and uh, media uprising um, and prevented the logging of the macaque's uh, forest habitat. They have Mike Pandey's Short of Silence, um, a film about the whale sharks in India. Um, that helped protect the whale sharks in India and put the whale shark on the uh, scientists list. Tom Peshak's National Geographic magazine articles, article on the manta rays at Hanavaru again contributed dramatically to the uh, success of making that marine area um, a protected site. 
and most recently, the, the man who stopped the, the desert. Um, this film was highlighted at the UN Convention to Combat Dan Desertification. And the, the sort of star of the film, the African farmer, um, actually was one of the, um, well, presented the opening ceremony to our uh, that convention to international delegates. And there are many examples of NGOs, conservation organizations, use, trying to use this imagery to catalyze a greater conservation ethic. You have the International League of Conservation Photographers and their photographic raves, sending um, some of the world's best photographers into the areas like the Elko, the Great Bear Rainforest, the Inland Peninsula, to really highlight the biodiversity in those areas and the threats they face. You have the IUCN Red List, of course, and their um, more recent use of uh, imagery and the amazing species and species of the day. And you have a, a, the latest WWF product, which was a, a cinema release, a short film that uh, toured the UK called Astonish Me, all about the new discoveries within uh, biodiversity over the last 10 to 50 years. And I think in the mass media communication society we, we, we live in today, we really need to make, take advantage of, of that. It's really important that biodiversity, nature, conservation, whatever we really need to call it for a particular audience, is on is still very much on everybody's agenda. Um, and so I'd like to take, take uh, a little bit of time and just tell you a little bit more about Wildscreen's own public education, public engagement, multimedia initiative called ARPA. And if the technology works, <coughs> We should have a little video playing which needs audio. No. It's embedded in the PowerPoint. No. Oh, oh that's mine. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And in case it didn't work, I also kept a separate version of it, separate to the PowerPoint, but it was embedded. So there should be a window media. There we go. Play the top one. Excellent. We've got audio. Better with music. No. Thanks, Mr. 
go back to the, uh, the panel point, that'd be great. So Archive is, is bringing together the world's best wildlife films and photographs on the world's um, species, prioritizing those on the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Um, we're storing them at high resolution offline for the benefit of future generations. So in 25, 50, 100 years time, there's a record, a digital media record um, of what life was like at the beginning of the 21st century. But more proactively promoting, promoting and facilitating access to this, uh, this collection as a valuable educational resource and conservation tool. Um, so far, we've profiled over 15,000 of the world's species. Uh, 9,000 of these are listed critically endangered to vulnerable on the IUCN red list. Um, these are contributed free of charge from um, over 6,500 <coughs> different uh, filmmakers and photographers, scientists, conservationists. And, and last year, the archive website received over 10 million visits from uh, all around the world. Behind me are uh, a few examples of the, uh, the imagery that was provided to the uh, Species Survival Commission some 1,400 images from about 500, uh, for about 500 species. Um, we've only pro profiled 9,000 of the 19,000 on the IUCN Red List, so we're really looking to work with the SSC <coughs> and the IUCN members to get that number up. Um, as well as profiling the world's endangered species and having that encyclopedia, we're also keen to look at other ways of reaching out, engaging, um, um, uh, with an audience, with different audiences. Um, at the education, the formal education sector is a very important audience for us. Um, and we're re repatching, repurposing those films, the videos, the species information to reduce formal education resources. Um, these are promoted on the archive website and on other third party educational platforms. And last year we had over 100,000 downloads of these educational resources. And if they were only used twice to an average class of 30, that's over. 600,000 kids that have access to this material, and we're trying to grow that as well. We've also worked really, really hard on our social media offering. Um, like many organizations, we have a, an active blog. Um, many of these blogs are uh, made up of topical content, what's happening in the calendar, what's happening in the news, and, um, and uh, what's popular in the news, what's trending in the news. Others are um, guest blogs, courtesy of wildlife filmmakers, photographers, scientists, wildlife TV presenters, the celebrity aspect. It's again to try and push this, uh, this message out there. Again, there's Twitter, there's Twitter and Facebook, and we spend a lot of time on uh, trying to grow these two online communities. Um, it's hard work. It needs a lot of, um, a lot of attention, a, a lot of communication. But so far, we've grown our um, Twitter and Facebook fans and followers to over 20,000. And these are all active archive ambassadors because, of course, they themselves have their own audiences. We're also looking at what we should be doing in the mobile space. Um, this last year, we produced our first mobile app, a gaming app called Survival, aimed at uh, youngsters and families. Um, and since it's launched at the uh, beginning of this year, we've had over 30,000 downloads of, uh, of Survival. And we're looking at uh, creating a, a mobile optimized version of the archive website. And we're trialing that at the moment with uh, QR code links from zoos, aquarium, museums. So again, bringing the archive content to a, a new audience. And we're also very, very keen to work with um, other organizations and get archive content on their platforms. Um, and today we've been quite successful working with the likes of the Environment Agency, Abu Dhabi, who I have to say are the, the principal sponsors of the archive project. And we wouldn't have uh, reached where we are on the archive project without their support. Um, IUCN, of course, WWF, Google Earth, Astro Geographic Kids. The whole point is to try and get this engaging, this inspiring content out there. So um, that's just a, a very quick overview of what we're doing with Archive. Um, if you've got imagery of the world's endangered species, we'd love to hear from you. If you're interested in using some of the Archive content on your own platforms, again, we'd love to hear from you. But if you just want to get involved in our blogs, our Twitter, our Facebook stuff, please do get in touch. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. I'm next. For those of you that arrived late, I'm John Francis. I get to talk to you for 10 minutes about BioBlitz as a powerful new tool for uh, engaging citizen scientists and growing the appetite and initiative around biodiversity. Um, so I was flying into Jeju 
I don't know if you all came in at night, but you might have seen the site I did, which was an unusual constellation on the water. It was squid fishermen. These 2,000 uh, watt lamps um, bring the squid from the depth and their factory hauled into the boats. And people get them shrink wrapped, even in the conference uh, hall here, if you happen to look at the, uh, at the uh, store downstairs where you could buy gifts. That shrink wrapping of nature, you know, the, the separation from the uh, natural systems is becoming an increasing problem, coined uh, nature deficit disorder by Richard Loof. And in fact, natural park, national park attendance has been dropping. This is a graph for the last, for the 96 or 86 to 2006 period. I will argue though today um, that there's not necessarily a technology or nature divide that actually the two can be united. National Geographic has worked for the last uh, six years with the national park system to pull as many as five, 6,000 people from urban centers into a national park unit to celebrate biodiversity. And this program has ended up getting more and more legs as we built this. We're doing 10 leading up to the National Park System Centennial in 2016, starting in Washington, D.C. in the Oak Forest, went to Los Angeles to the Chaparral of Santa Monica Mountains, to Chicago to the Indiana Dunes Lakeshore. Miami was the first uh, marine bioblitz in the state, second in the world and celebrated Biscayne National Park, Tucson, we hit the deserts, Denver, the mountains, New Orleans next year, we're going to the bayou. We're trying to cover different national park unit types as well as um, to celebrate different habitats, all the while doing it within an hour's drive of cities. The goals of these bio blitzes are to identify as many species as you can in a 24 hour period and to do it with experts and at the same time to celebrate biodiversity and to bring to kids especially, but families, the joy of knowing nature. We try to unite scientists in particular, and we have as many as 200 of them who will be experts in all taxonomic groups, and they actually get to be the guides, you know, groups of 12, 15, for kids learning what it's like to be a lepidopterist or to study slime mold even. And uh, the whole idea, as I said before, is getting these, these kids, these city dwellers into nature and actually have a clue about where their life services come from. Promoting protected areas as well as inspiring the next generation of stewards for the planet is our ambition, and we do it in a big way. Here in Mon Santa Monica Mountains, we have the Conservancy load 2,000 kids from the Yale Unified School District and take them into the Santa Monica Mountains where they got to go out on walks with their teachers. Many of them are prepared for weeks in advance to do this field trip and to learn about nature. The cool story here is that some of these kids had never even had their feet in the water. They were in the ocean. These kids were from the LA, you know, downtown, midtown, urban LA, five miles away, the ocean, and it took something like this event to have them actually experience the marine environment at the Malibu Pier. These kids were beside themselves with joy, and it's absolutely astounding that the cultures didn't allow them to get in the ocean earlier in their, of their lives. By inspiring the future of taxonomists, we hope to not only learn more about the natural bits that we want to protect, but we want to get people to think about what's in their own backyard. This guy, Gary Hevel, has been to every one of our bioblitzes. He lives in Silver Spring, Maryland, my hometown, and he's collected 4,000 species of insect in his own backyard. He brings some of them to every bioblitz, and he talks to these kids about how wonderful life is in the insect world. The scientists, as well, are incredible ambassadors. They go out and lead public teams. The guy in the blue shirt in the upper right is Randy Miller. He's a tardigrade expert, and he actually found a new species of tardigrade in Biscayne, just two uh, bio blitzes ago. We have informal educators who are wonderful to interpret the natural world, world to uh, kids, and we also have high quality data that comes into the national park system. So they actually expand their species list for each park that we go to. Um, exhibitors, as many as 50 different exhibitors, local partners who end up building greater bridges to the public and the National Park Service, and we have a variety of public presentations and a whole celebration of biodiversity that includes music, art, poetry, and songs. The guy in the lower right-hand corner is Billy B. He composes a different song and dance routine for every um, bio blitz, and it's a riot to hear him sing and, and dance, and he gets the kids up on stage. It's an absolute festival. Social media, we, you know, the, the kids and uh, our staff come in big way to blog, to Facebook, to load YouTube, and we even have 
this huge um, facility for teachers to prepare in the preceding months uh, for the educational opportunity and you have more information than you can imagine if you want to do your own bio blitz. Not just how to do it, but all of the uh, class um, K through 12, different level class material that you might require to get your students into this event. Field scope, uh, uh, building off our cartographic excellence that you've seen with Frank, we have a GIS platform that the students use and teachers to map the results of their work in these bio blitzes and to learn how to actually record data in the environment. So this is a, uh, an analytical tool that's really quite powerful and is embedded in our, our every bio blitz that we do now. Um, in, in reaching bigger audiences beyond the five or 6,000, which is still significant, we have um, embarked on electronic field trips like this one in Saguaro, which you can actually go and listen to and see a one-hour compilation of a live broadcast that we did to 